Hey everyone, my name is Michael Easton, or KK6OOZ, and I'm a lab tech for Open Research Institute. ORI is a nonprofit 501c3 research and development organization which provides all of its work to the general public under the principles of open source and open access to research. We do technical and regulatory work as well, as this past year we made some major strides forward for the Amateur Radio Satellite Service with a successful commodity jurisdiction request of the U.S. State Department. We received a final determination letter stating that open source satellite work is free of the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR. These regulations control defense products, and the open source approach has been found as the best strategy for designing amateur satellites in the United States. The second part of that particular regulatory effort is going on right now. ORI is asking the U.S. Commerce Department to make a similar ruling about open source satellite work in the Export Administration Regulations. Indications are very positive that the news will be good for amateur radio. After all, we'll ask for something called an advisory opinion. This will tie the two results together and make them super clear. Another big area of regulatory work is debris mitigation. These rules are intended to reduce space junk, prevent explosions, and deorbit spacecraft as soon as possible after a mission is complete. More innovation and wider access to space are the expected results for the many commercial companies participating in what the FCC calls the new space race. The regulatory requirement for spacecraft to do more to avoid collisions means that attitude control and propulsion are necessary things to deal with with for full access to space. Regulatory work is very important. It's part of ORI's commitment to the amateur radio service, but the motivation for all this legal work is so that we can have the most fun advancing the radio arts to the very edge of what's possible in innovative ways. We live in a time where we are capable of literally maximizing the number of digital bits we transmit over the air. These advanced communications Engineering techniques allowing successful links at very low signal-to-noise ratios are not out of reach of interested amateurs. All too often, the most advanced wireless technology is secret, proprietary, or considered too complex for the mere hobbyist to master. But this isn't true. You don't have to be an expert to build or use these radios. You just have to be willing to become more of an expert along the way. And the focus of all this advanced digital communications work it's not to write yet another paper of squeeze out another tenth of a dB in the lab. The focus is you, the operator. Let's talk about you. One of the most common complaints about digital modes is the voice quality. You don't want to listen to hours of scratchy, tiny, compressed voice codecs that were designed for maximum subscriber revenue in 1997. Amateur digital communications should sound fantastic. There is no excuse for anything less. You should be able to instantly recognize the voice on the other side of the contact. Therefore, our user requirement is exceptional voice quality while still being efficient and smart about bandwidth. The solution? The voice encoder isn't built in. High quality open source voice encoding is layered on top of a solid digital signal. Do you want your contacts to sound like they were standing right there? You can choose that. You want to sound like a proprietary codec? You can choose that, too, if you really want to. Let's talk more about you, though. Do you want a reliable amateur digital communication system that doesn't depend on an internet connection? A system that's fun and easy to use? A system that doesn't have three cryptic functions per button? And won't need nine steps to change a basic setting? We do, too. Therefore, our user requirement is accessibility and ease of use. An accessible and easy to use system breaks down many barriers to learning. We don't believe people are motivated to learn more about digital communications when the radios are restrictive, sound harsh, are inflexible, or are just hard to use. An accessible system helps everyone enjoy the radio, not just people with low vision or who have trouble with fine motor skills. Software defined radios can learn and adapt to operators in ways that uh, we are just beginning to understand, appreciate, and implement. Imagine a radio that learns you prefer the backlight low, but the front large and the contrast high when you are monitoring a meetup conference or net. However, it learns you need a detail screen, brighter light, and lower contrast when searching for a roving station. 
the radio learns you would like a report or possibly a recording of who was on the satellite for the Thursday night net, even though you have to work late this quarter and will end up missing it. User interfaces from microwave radios like Phase 4 Ground are significantly different from traditional microwave appliances. Legacy radios were fixed in form and function. Software-defined radios, however, allow for the radio to fit you. Machine learning techniques give a radio a little bit of soul. The Phase 4 microwave system automatically adapts to the structure of the transmissions to the needs of the link. This is called adaptive coding and modulation. The radio chooses the best possible combinations of modulations and forward error correction codes from a collection that covers all the expected signal conditions. When learning about any microwave technique or building up a system, one of the most useful things we have are beacons. The payload or central node of the Phase 4 system uses an open protocol called DVBS2. This protocol is always transmitting digital frames of data, and when no one is talking, the frames are essentially empty train cars being sent one after another. They're called dummy frames in the specification. However, as amateurs, we love to fill up the quiet. We've put our dummy frames to use. When there is no user data, the dummy frames will cycle through all the modulations and coatings so that new users and experimenters can test their receivers against all possibilities available in the protocol. It's like having a beacon built into the system. Whether the payload is on a satellite or a mountaintop, being able to make performance measurements like this is very valuable. Our, our transmitter designers have actually scheduled a demonstration in March of 2021. Here's a block diagram of what's required to make that demonstration work. A link to the repository is in the slides and in the transcript below. The transmitter demonstration uses a field programmable gate array, or FPGA. All the code is publicly available for others to use, learn from, modify, and even improve. We take data and organize it into frames. We provide extra data to help receivers find the start of each frame so that your receiver doesn't have to work so hard to bring it in. We use direct memory access to connect the processor to the programmable logic. We use something called an Advanced Extensionable Interface, or AXI, to connect different parts of the FPGA. The radio chip is from analog devices. We use the AD9361. We connect the radio chip with a high-speed interface. The languages for the FPGA design are Verilog and VHDL. These are computer languages that describe digital hardware circuits with software commands. When you compile this code and move it into an FPGA, the FPGA is physically reconfigured. Need to make changes? Load a different combination. FPGAs are an excellent fit for another really neat advanced digital concept, polyphase filter banks. We use polyphase filtering techniques on an uplink receiver, which is separated into frequency channels. When you are acquired by the system, you are assigned one of the uplink channels. Here's Michelle Thompson, W5NYV, to explain more about polyphase techniques. Hello, my name is Michelle Thompson. I'm a co-founder of ORI and currently serve as CEO. So what is polyphase? It's all about using decimation and interpolation. These two techniques change the rate of the sample stream to accomplish some very clever work. That's why we call this type of work multi-rate processing. Decimation throws away samples. We might get rid of every other sample, every fifth sample, or every hundredth sample. It depends on what we're out to do. Decimation reduces the sample rate. Interpolation inserts samples in between existing data. Those inserted samples often have a value of zero. We can upsample a sequence by a factor m by inserting m minus 1 zeros between each real sample. This increases the sample rate because we have more entries per unit time than we did before. We can also insert samples that are the average of the samples to either side. Here we have a signal that has been sampled. You can see the waveform in the upper middle of the whiteboard. We are going to make three polyphase out of this. We're marking them with a circle, a triangle, and a square. The sampling rate of these polyphase channels is one-third of the original sample rate. What does this do for us? In this example, we want three channels, and we need them to be sampling rate divided by three wide in frequency. We end up with three polyphases that we're going to name 0, 1, and 2. Now, we're in the realm of digital sampling, 
So things aren't quite the same as analog. There is a way to think about this that isn't too hard. And the way to think about it is here in this image. This is a rod and reel, like you use when you go fishing. You are reeling in the samples on the timeline. And when you wind up that timeline on your reel, the angular measurement, the thing you are winding with your hand on the reel, that angle around the full loop is something we call phase. A lot of us that volunteer for ORI are burners. This whiteboard was at math camp in 2019. We had a residency there where we were able to talk about these concepts to participants that wandered in and out of the camp. There is nothing quite like trying to explain polyphase filter banks to someone in a laser-encrusted moose costume at 4 a.m. to sharpen the pedagogy. Now, if moose man can understand it, then so can the rest of us in the cold light of day wearing ordinary clothing, which most days right now is fancy PJs. Touché, burning man. So here we are trying to explain it the ordinary university way, with rotating vectors coming at you out of the whiteboard. This was a disaster, and a mathematician from Austria made fun of us. It wasn't hard. We were making a mess of trying to explain it. But eventually, we had our eureka moment. We called it rod and reel, but this must be something that has been presented before. We aren't claiming invention, but we do enthusiastically endorse this way of explaining digital sampling. If the fishing line is a timeline, and the digital samples are spaced out at equal intervals, then you can treat this like you are reeling in time, and it's coiling up in loops on the reel. The diameter of the reel in the diagram reveals some very important concepts. What fraction of the rotation of the reel, the circle, do you traverse per sample? This is digital frequency. This is expressed in radians per sample. How far around the circle do you need to go to hit another sample? Notice that the diameter of the reel, the circle you're winding the sample train around, varies with respect to frequency. If you want the same number of samples per full rotation, this is an expected result. Large frequency means small diameter circle. Low frequency signals need a large diameter circle. Circumference is pi times diameter. The diameter is circumference divided by pi. The circumference of this circle is the time it takes for the full signal period. This is T of S. The diameter of the loop is T of S divided by pi. We have four samples per period here. When we reel in our samples and the diameter of the reel is T of S divided by pi, then the samples line up on the reel. This is super useful. Why? At the Nyquist rate, which is the limit of how often you have to sample a signal in order to be able to reconstruct it, you must have at least two points on the circle. That's the limit. You can't have a diameter of a circle with just one point in space. You need at least two points. And that is, visually, why the Nyquist limit works. Okay, so we have what's called critical sampling. This is the case when we have two samples on the circle of coiled up time. If we sample more often, we call this oversampled. It's the second one from the top on this slide. Undersampled, like we said before, is when you only have one sample on the circle. This provides not enough information to know what the waveform looks like. Tangles. Notice our polyphase colors are oversampled. We're going to use that fact to divide up the sample stream and get distinct channels out of this. Here's what this looks like in the frequency domain. Enjoy some ambient sound and check things out. Each of the center frequencies in these examples gets a phase shift. A shift in time is a shift in phase. We only calculate what we need, so depending on what channel we want to look at, we can throw away all the rest. Breaking down complex concepts into understandable and useful circuit designs and giving them away for free may sound crazy, but this has been the spirit of amateur radio experimentalism since the very beginning. Uh, I'm Anshul Makka. I contribute to a few of the embedded projects uh, for ORI. And also, I am researching on debris mitigation for our next space mission at ORI. Um, in, the, in the past, ARSS community um, has 
uh, done various non has provided various non commercial effort has been involved in various non commercial efforts uh, which have led to this cubesat and small smart, small sat revolution uh, but in this new era uh, there are few more challenges uh, due to commercialization of the space uh, and one of the challenge relates to debris mitigation and this will be the my uh, focus point for my uh, talk at ham expo uh, ARSS community uh, sh should not be limited to only LEO orbits. Uh, in no way I'm saying that LEO orbits are less important uh, or less effective. They, are, they have high educational values and are good for experimentation. But if we see the dream of providing communication across the globe, 24 cross seven, then this geo orbit uh, provides us with the perfect opportunity as it provides us with a space stationary point uh, to which our earth stations can be uh, to which our earth stations can point and have the regular communication to achieve this um, to achieve this goal to reach that height uh, we need to abide by the rules framed by fcc uh, in, in 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 my talk at ham expo i will be giving a gmat demo um, for planning your mission, which will show a graphical representation of uh, planning your mission to meet the requirements of FCC regarding debris mitigation. Also, I will, I will present a mathematical paper which will decipher uh, how we can calculate Delta V propellant budget. All these will help you to plan your mission in, in a most efficient and effective way, along with meeting the guidelines framed by FCC. Uh, so please join me at Ham Expo 13th of March uh, for my talk. Thank you.